Well, we're very excited to be uh, here because we've got Professor E.D. Hirsch Jr., uh, one of the uh, one of my one of my intellectual heroes. Um, someone, I've been, someone I've been reading for quite a long time, and uh, and so we're going to be talking to Professor Hirsch about his new book, published by uh, John Cat in the UK. Um, how to educate a citizen, and um, we've got a whole set of questions lined up, haven't we, Martin? We have indeed, and um, there's no time like the present, perhaps, to ask the first one. So, um, Professor Herschel, can I call you Don, by the way? Please go ahead, call me Don. Thank you. Um, you're you're known over here primarily, probably, because of the uh, book Cultural Literacy, and that opens up a question. Um, I think it was Raymond Williams who said culture is one of the most complicated words in the English language. What does it mean to you? What do you mean by culture? Well, uh, in general terms, I would connect uh, uh, culture with uh, the term ethnicity. Ethnicity is uh, widely misused in the United States. Uh, uh, because it's often combined with race. And I, I think it, as a bit of background, you know, I have this scientific bent. Uh, uh, it was really science and, and reading in psycholinguistics that uh, started me on this path. Um, it, it, it turns out that as in, in brain studies, recent brain studies, the human neocortex, which is where all school learning and culture reside, um, is a blank slate. Locke, John Locke was right about that. And we now know that with some molecular certitude. And uh, so it, it's something learned first. Of, of, uh, it's not anything innate. And what's chiefly learned in relation to culture is its connection with language. Um, and I, then if you don't mind, I'll stick in another bit of science, which is um, evolutionary biology and uh, why it was that we, uh, in relation to the apes, developed such a big brain, which is the bigness is that neocortex, which is a blank slate. So we were evolved to create culture, to, 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 create, to have language and to make culture. And that size of the brain, because uh, compared to the apes, because we interact so much with each other and act in tribes, in our nations, that that collectivity is held together by language. And language uh, has to be held together by culture. And the big advance in, in, in linguistics and language science was the discovery. And by the way, this is what got me into uh, early education, um, was the discovery of how important what you don't hear or don't see mm. is in language that that is the background knowledge is needed the right kind of shared knowledge with the speaker or the writer you have to have the background knowledge that that writer or speaker is taking for granted and it's usually a huge amount of background knowledge and and value and attitude that is to being taken for granted in any piece of writing or in any speech. I use the example of Polly put the kettle on, we'll all have tea. And uh, that's just fine. But put the kettle on what? And what's in the kettle? And why do you need to put the kettle on to have tea? That all of that is unsaid. Uh, and yet it's a nursery rhyme. I mean, it's so simple. It, it was the simplest piece of of uh, language I could find. And there, even there, there's a huge amount of background knowledge. And so our big brains, this big neocortex, has to hold 
all of that cultural knowledge or language knowledge, let's call it language knowledge to start with, that is to be able to use the language, you have to have all of that background knowledge. That is chiefly what a culture is, I would say. So your your 1980 book, Cultural Literacy, um, probably was most famous or perhaps notorious for the list of 5,000 facts that every American ought to know. Um, and and you um, obviously derived that list from, from looking at, the, I think, from the New York Times and sort of looking at all of the things that were unsaid that, uh, that, that in much more complex pieces of writing than Polly put the kettle on. To what extent... Do you still stand by um, that that list, that approach, um, or is it something you think you've moved on from? Oh, I I think that the, the, just as uh, history marches on, so does culture, and um, so does print culture. I like to use the term uh, print culture because. Yeah. Uh, the, to uh, immediately put it in a political context and say it's the, it's the culture of the powerful and so on. It's also the culture of communication. That's the key thing. I mean, nations, well, I'd like to go back to the tribe because uh, it's the clearest way to see it, uh, it, it the, from an evolutionary standpoint. The tribe has to educate the young. The young are born with a blank slate, as Locke said. And the, the, this big brain of ours is, is because we're born into a tribe. And the elders teach the language of the tribe so that they can be such a fearsome organism. I mean, the, the human tribe was victorious in, in evolutionary terms because it had this ability to for rapid and effective and subtle communications, uh, which enabled it to do all kinds of things. But it is from the start a cooperative uh, venture. And uh, one of the interesting features in evolutionary psychology is this mixture of selfishness and altruism in, in the human psyche. But the, the altruistic is also uh, very much uh, a part. And uh, let me just uh, add a footnote that I think is in the end highly relevant. That is uh, in the social world is a famous article by the two Wilsons, E.O. Wilson, the sociobiologist, and uh, David Wilson, the evolutionary psychologist. They wrote an article, in, and the end was uh, that within groups, selfishness wins, but between groups, the altruistic society or group beats the selfish society or group. And uh, so both elements are very much in the human psyche, as the Ten Commandments well indicate. And so uh, the job of education into the group is to encourage the altruistic and the communicative or the cultural. Now, I mean, you can go fast forward in, when you have the printing press and so on, so that the uh, smaller group can turn into a, a modern nation. But nonetheless, uh, we are evolved to train young people into becoming members of the group. That's a, a key thing to remember. It's, it's the, the group, not, <laughs> it was only in modernity that we, we started seeing self-fulfillment as being an important aspect of education. But the primary aspect is to be a functioning member of a tribe and to learn the tribal lore and to learn the tribal language. Is that, so, a, is that that's a pretty long answer, right? It is. It's, it's, it's very clear, Don. Thank you. Um, we're talking about tribal um, groupings, if you like. Now, when tribes are set within a nation and they all the same tribe if you like uh, bordered quite happily um, from other tribes and and uh, knowing where they are is slightly different to many tribes living together 
in in one nation perhaps so how yes. how do you talk about dominant culture or, or the idea of a, a, a cultural I, I don't talk in terms of dominance. no no uh, there is I don't talk in terms of knowledge uh, that issue uh, I just learned recently was was dealt with forcibly by Frederick Douglass uh, you know who Frederick Douglass is yeah, he's course, yeah. a fantastic character and uh, he uh, said well the American tribe, the American nation, nation means tribe, not you, what you're born into, um, it is a, a composite nationalism. It's a composite nation. And that's true. It was That was the experiment. But our founders uh, accepted the fact that they had to adopt a new culture, a new tribe. Uh, the hero of my book, this uh, How to Educate a Citizen, is Noah Webster, who said, no, 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 we can't follow the English uh, mm. manner. They called it in the 18th century, they called it manners, which I like as a term for culture because it indicates that it's something learned, something added on, something you can uh, acquire. And people can acquire more than one culture. And the proof of it is they acquire more than one language. You can't have a language without the attendant. You, you can't master a language without the attendant culture. Precisely because uh, language requires that background knowledge, which I think is the definition of culture, the shared background knowledge. And uh, without that, you don't have language and uh, and you don't have culture. So fast forward from that point that if you can have more than one language, you can have more than one culture. And what you have to have in the United States, I'm an assimilationist, which is very unfashionable, is you adopt a common culture, which is the duty of the schools to uh, promulgate. So that even though you have, and people come from all kinds of tribes in the USA, uh, there is such a thing as an American ethnicity because ethnicity is not something innate. The racialization of ethnicity is a moral mistake and a political mistake and a technical mistake. It's a mistake all along the line and it's rampant in the United States to our dis dismay. And so the multicultural movement, I think, was misconceived it, the, it, it, in the sense that it assumed that the culture that you, of your ancestors, the culture of your mother, father, grandparents, is something you can't throw off, that it's part of your essence. Uh, well, that I call the racialization of culture because it's turning it into something of your birth culture. It's ancestor worship. It's kind of considered something essential to you. But that birth culture is not any more essential than any other culture you pick up. So that's the hope for the United States, that there can be a, a, an American ethnicity, an American culture at the same time that you keep your familial culture. That's uh, that's really interesting that you talk about it that way and that you use the word uh, essence. And um, I don't know if you're aware of the philosopher um, Kwame Anthony Apaya, and he talks about one of the mistakes that we make is being an, an assumption of essentialism, where we view people of different groups, different tribes, if you like, is having this essential component, which means that we sort of understand them and we expect them to behave in particular ways. And I, and I wonder well, that, if you're there about the essence not being innate. Is there an American essence? Yes, I mean, it's one we make ourselves. Uh, <laughs> and it's still in the course of being defined and it's still in the course of being made. But when you say essence, I mean, that, that's exactly what I'm repudiating. Is that Right. That it's it, 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 there is a, race is something that you're born with. I mean, your skin color is what it is, uh, but your brain is the same as any other 
baby's brain. Uh, that's the great discovery of these brain of this current brain research, that the a black baby's brain or a red baby or a yellow baby or a white baby or pink, if you will, yeah. all of them, all of them have got the same blank slate. And uh, that's a wonderful, I'm so pleased that uh, I lived long enough to f have uh, John Locke defeat Rousseau <laughs> <laughs> on that score. So, you know, I, these are pretty fundamental questions you're asking, and I'm very glad you are, because the last section of this book of mine uh, is called American Ethnicity. Mm. Uh, and uh, it, it's implicitly a plea for the assimilationist point of view and the fact that we can uh, accommodate and, and be highly welcoming to all kinds of different secondary cultures. But, but we do have a created culture, a made culture, just the way Noah Webster had planned it. And it's, it's worked, it, as long as people kept that view, uh, except for the exclusion of, of, of blacks and race prejudice, it, uh, in early on, there was a commonality in schooling that uh, worked pretty well. And uh, just technically, up till about 1940, the USA, was uh, had the number one ranking in adult literacy in in the world, and uh, there's been a huge decline since because of its theories. And of course, that's another subject hmm. of the current of the current book. I'm oh. interested there talking about the blank slate of, of the of the child. Does culture have a blank slate, though? I mean, what what is it that should be um, valued in a culture. Uh, uh, what what terms well, can you say? I mean, for instance, well, you're saying first of all, it's it's so, uh, it's sorry, it's sorry. Rather, so, it's rather inert. The the dominant culture is rather inert because of the printing press. I mean, the, uh, what you have is is a print culture, and I think we have to take it out. We shouldn't regard this big national print culture as something very narrow, belonging only to a group. It belongs to anybody who goes to school with a, diff with a reasonably good school system and acquires the print culture, and the, which is the national culture. And I just checked the other day. I was looking up, well, I wonder how many English language newspapers Bangladesh has. It has 24 English language newspapers. And I just sampled it and I could read them all because I learned the sort of English language print culture, uh, which enabled, so it isn't all of, it isn't just the possession of the powerful class. It's hard to become powerful if you don't gain that print culture. But it's intergenerational. It's a, it's a historical residue. It's very hard to just change it by fiat. You can change it around the edges, but you've got all those books and all those newspapers that are still being printed, and that you've got the generations of people who are using that national print culture. So, it, I think to tribalize it, it it's a great it's the great hope instead of looking at, at the dominant culture as the enemy, it's the great hope for unification of, of all peoples. Uh, and uh, if somebody, well, that, and it, suppose somebody says, well, that's your culture. We want to have the school study our culture. Okay, you try to do it. The parents would not like that. Uh, it may be some academic at the university have, when I might have that view, but they want their kids to succeed. They want their kids to master that print culture, get a good job. Uh, in, and uh, I've seen that. Uh, there's a, there are some schools in the South Bronx, which is, a, I, I treat that, that example in my, my book. Uh, and I, I don't know how far uh, 
you want to take this or, or why uh, <laughs> maybe you're having these arguments in Britain too so uh, yeah but I think I, I think it is up to the to the uh, in the in the United States it's the uh, it's the individual states that have the legal authority to set uh, the standard so-called standards for elementary schools in Britain it's I suppose the central government uh, which has that authority. Yeah. And, uh, and what needs to happen, in my opinion, is that the public needs to do that. The, the public and the parents uh, need to demand that there be a set of topics, shared common topics, grade by grade. It doesn't have to be the whole curriculum, but that's the only way you can achieve equity is uh, if you do that. I can explain that in more detail if you'd like, but uh, it's only through commonality of topics in the early grades that you can achieve equity. Okay, that's, um, just, we'll just have a quick uh, pause for a moment. Is, can you still hear me, Don? I'm sorry? Can you still hear me? Yes, I can. Mm -hmm. Have we lost Martin, Nils? So um, we, I, I definitely want to go back, and I'm sure Martin will want to go back and pick up on some of those points as well. But I just want to just to clarify a potential confusion or misunderstanding that some of our uh, viewers might have. So you've talked about the the blank slate and uh, Rousseau versus uh, versus Locke, and um, you know, so so I think that you've you've probably started to make it clear by talking about all children starting with the same slate. Um, but but there will be people aware of, for instance, you know, Stephen Pinker talking about the fact that we are born with perhaps certain um, instincts, which mean we acquire certain types of knowledge much more readily than others. And um, and, and, and I think one of the, the dangers that sometimes people or the, the flags that people have when they hear blank slate is they start thinking about John B. Watson and, and, and that, you know, that, that it's possible for anybody to be anything. It, and that's not what you mean, is it? Oh, no. Uh, there is a human nature yeah. because, for, for one thing, there are other parts of the brain besides the neocortex. The neocortex is where uh, schooling and culture reside, but it's not where the sex urge resides. It's not where envy, lust, and all the seven uh, deadly sins reside. It's uh, <laughs> the human nature is not a blank slate by any means right. and uh, and uh, I and in that respect as Stephen Pinker you know wrote a, a book called the blank slate in <laughs> which he, in which he was uh, essentially uh, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 denying uh, the idea but but he didn't he is that the, the trouble is uh, he, of course, he wrote that book long before these uh, recent brain studies uh, came out, and I have no doubt that he would readily grant what they found out, which is that yes, where the area where we have schooling and culture is a blank slate, right. and and uh, that area is terribly important, and the reason Locke himself. Uh, inferred uh, that it, 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 as against the rationalists that uh, that humans had this blank slate was he saw he looked around and he said look at all these different cultures all over the world that I mean it's obviously they're not inborn because uh, they're so different they're so varied languages vary and and uh, Attitudes vary and customs vary tremendously. So that it can't be there can't be a sort of universal inborn human nature. And of course, he's right. Right. And, 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 and in fact, the, the, that logic seems to me in itself, even though it happened in the 17th century, is perfectly correct. Um, don't our, our feel, we feel things slightly differently? I mean, you know, so, um, and we, we have different tastes. So perhaps yep. I like something a bit bitter, someone else likes something a bit sweet. 
is the same for Shakespeare or a popular novelist, for instance. If if I think Shakespeare is good, and somebody, uh, perhaps a pupil, thinks Shakespeare isn't good, aren't our feelings okay? Then the kid will never like Shakespeare, but I will. Or or does the child have to change their their view, their taste? Be my guest. Uh, the, the only thing, the, but but the only thing is that I <laughs> that I would. <laughs> say about that is nonetheless if everybody's going to be referring to shakespeare's and what uh, shakespearean say i mean it's very useful to understand uh what the illusion is when somebody says a plague on both your houses that uh, you you know it's it's just uh you don't want to be ignorant of what everybody else knows. That's <laughs> whether you like it or not. I, uh, so there is there is an element that I, I don't think a young child, in other words, should just be permitted to follow his own tastes in, in what he likes to read and what he not. There's certain things that's going to be beneficial for that child to know because of the character of the culture of the tribe that he's going into. Yeah. So I, that, I, I guess you were talking about individualism of some kind or other, the difference of taste, of course there are. Yes, and I, the point that you mentioned there about you not, not um, wanting children to follow their own interests. I remember reading an article where you talked about your own education and that mm -hmm. you went to a school for a while where you absolutely did. Um, you were given an opportunity to discover what you liked and, uh, and that you quite enjoyed it. And despite that experience, you'd still say. And I think that, you know, the, the, the whole um, rationale behind the core knowledge program, which is obviously based very much on your works and your belief and the idea of shared knowledge, um, is, is, is well established in parts of the United States. It's starting to become more popular in, in, in certain um, corners of the, of the UK. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the central tenets of the Core Knowledge Programme? Yes, well, the, first it started, it started with a sequence. It, 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 that is, it was very clear to me that it, with this equity aim in view, that you had to have a definite curriculum for the following reason. It, you, you have to base the new lesson on material that the school has already taught. Otherwise, you're trapped in the background knowledge that you happen to have from your home. Hmm. And so, and uh, I just was dealing with this in relation to the, the tremendous gap in reading scores between blacks and whites, 13-year-olds uh, in the United States. And it's been such a scandal that the... That the uh, and it's because of the theories that are, are dominant in our education schools, and it, it, which are you know child-centered and and the belief that there is such a thing as a general reading comprehension skill, which is a wrong theory. And it, it's we have I mean it's these wrong educational theories are nation-threatening. It's not. It's really not a, a left-right thing. That's why I like to bring it back down to the elemental, uh, evolutionary, tribal uh, principles. That is uh, the only way a tribe can work is with this commonly shared knowledge, which is the only way language can work. And you can't have a, uh, any kind of human grouping without a shared language. I'm interested there in what you're saying about um, sequencing, I think sequencing is vital in any curriculum. Um, how do we deal with argument where where in, in the tribe that there are people who, who disagree, even about language, even about language itself? You know, these are the wrong words. You can't use those words. You shouldn't have a voice there, et cetera, et cetera. And Ooh, in the context of the New York Times 1619 and the patriotic curriculum of Trump, 
is is there any way of having argument in curriculum rather than just having perhaps the few of the dominant tribe? Oh, sure. Yeah, I mean, it, it, you can decide that's what you want to make your curriculum. Uh, that's fine. Uh, it, it, look, it's a pol it, basically in a democracy. Uh, it seems to me that that kind of issue. Uh, what well, first of all the. Once the public understands that the only way you can get uh, equity and uh, a reasonable degree of, of unity in, in a nation is if the elementary curriculum is uh, shared so that you can have shared communications. If the, what, what, and, and also people can have uh, similar opportunities that can be brought to the point where uh, they're, they're not left behind. So the only way you can have that is if you have this sequence, this sequence of topics in those grades so that the class itself becomes a speech community and everybody can understand what's going on in the class. So in, in other words, in schooling itself, you have to have what ultimately uh, the tribe has to have the school has to the school classroom has to be a tribe in order to be an effective classroom that's another perhaps i had never thought put it that way before but uh, that's a, an interesting way to put it it has to be a speech community. another way of saying it has to be a tribe you have to make a tribe out of the uh classroom in order for everybody to be able to be a member of the class and to learn. That, that's because of this background knowledge, necessity in language itself. That's the most important discovery about language in the last, at least the last, has, or perhaps the last 200 years. It's a tremendous, it's, it's so, it, it, it took so long to discover it because it's invisible. Mm. It's just not there. You study language, you study syntax, you study all kinds of elements of language but how can you study the hidden background knowledge that's required to make it communicable? And, but evolution decided that was the way language had to be because it's so efficient uh, that, that people who with this big brain could communicate fast. <laughs> There's a Polly is don't put the kettle on Polly. There's a tiger, and <laughs> Polly has to know from the tribal lore what to do. She does, she can't wait around and be told. Uh, so you you can have intricate and uh, a very effective communications only on the basis of this uh, system of background knowledge or shared background knowledge. So you, there's plenty of time if you're studying this stuff in school, but when it comes time for action or for communication, for doing something with the group as a whole, there has to be widespread communication and the communication has to be effective. But the same sort of thing, the same sort of language need is, is true in the, in the elementary classroom, which means that you, the kids have to have shared background knowledge so that they can understand the next lesson. And right. that, it's such a simple point, but on the other hand, it's so easy to miss because it's invisible. It's invisible. Right. And, and, but you know, it's taken me many decades to get that level of clarity. I mean, it's, uh, it is very simple once you, once you grasp how fundamental it is and why it took so long to discover that feature of language. It took so long because it's precisely because it's invisible. And uh, yet it's the, I would say, you know, I just looked up uh, today. Well, what is it that the linguists are saying about language universals? And of course you don't see that. Uh, it listed because it isn't something there that you can observe. Yet it is perhaps the most important language universal. You can't have a human language without that principle of shared 
that, or, or of co what we call culture at the start of the conversation. Right. Yes, absolutely. And so maybe maybe they yeah, part of the answers in that the argument is made possible through shared language. Now, Don, I want to just briefly ask you um, a little bit about um, the you know the so, some so, something about the distinction between politics and culture because it might surprise some viewers to know that you would perhaps describe yourself as a socialist because uh, certainly some people in the UK might see you as being a figure of the right. And I've got a short, well, I've got two two things that I want to sort of um, put in front of you to comment on. One is a short quote from uh, your previous book, um, Why Knowledge Matters. And I'm just going to read that to you if, if it's okay. Because you say, um, because of an inherent and inescapable inertia in the knowledge that is shared amongst hundreds of millions of people, the core knowledge, knowledge plan is necessarily traditional. And, it's, and it was criticised for being so. And then you make the point that the aim of giving everybody entree to the knowledge of power ran smack up against the aim of deprivileging those who are currently privileged. And, and, and just to just just hold on a second. So because you closed your new book with the final chapter is um, patriotism. And then the, the, you, you have a colon, patriotism, sh shared knowledge and kindness. And, and I'd, I'd like to invite you to sort of explain how, how, you, how you resolve those conflicts and tensions in your work. Well, I, I don't say anything, of course, about deprivileging anybody. I was interested in giving everybody a, sh uh, a fair chance. Yeah. My definition of equity is not, to pull any, not necessarily pull anybody down. Uh, it, I, except I, I, I don't believe in pulling anybody down, but I do believe in soaking the rich. I, I, I like uh, I like a, <laughs> a disproportionate tax structure and and making sure everybody. But it, this idea of giving everybody a chance, uh, I, I don't even isn't it isn't that even a view of the right? I'm a little confused on on that point. If you once you understand that what people are wrongly calling uh, the culture of privilege, no, I would say it's the culture of those who have a who have acquired and can keep privilege because they're highly competent. You can't be competent in a in the tribe until you master the lore of the tribe. Uh, then, then you can be competent. Uh, how about that? Is there is there a sense in which there are, people can agree that you can't be competent until you master until you have master literacy? Uh, and it turns out that mastering the literacy of the of the nation uh, involves knowing the stuff that. Uh, privileged people know. I, I don't think I ever use that term privilege. Uh, I haven't seen that. Oh. But it is it's true, of course. It's true. There's, there's no doubt that uh, pampered and <laughs> rich kids who get into universities at, uh, in USA and that the, uh, the, there was the chairman of the uh, sociology department at the University of Chicago gave a marvelous incoming speech to those shooters, he said, well, you know, now you're here, you really don't have to do anything. Uh, <laughs> you, you're already set on a path according to the sociological data that you're going to be fine. Mm. It doesn't matter what your major is or what else. So all of that is true, but only only because they got into the university, possibly because they they had a favorable family background, but possibly just because they had a good education. Mm. Don, most of your work focuses on pupils from the age of about five to about 13. I remember seeing you talk a few years ago now, and you're talking about the years after 13, where you said a degree of self-actualization could take place, you know, people Perhaps people can break out of the tribe. You didn't say that. I'm just wondering if uh, yeah. that, that might be the space for someone to break out. 
I may have been I may have been a little bit autobiographical in that uh, you know I grew up in Memphis Tennessee and uh, I didn't know anybody who wasn't a severe racist and 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 not only that I didn't know anybody who wasn't uh, sort of prejudiced against uh, uh, women's equality and uh, so but because I started reading books on my own at you know age. 15 and 16 and so on. And there was a, a book in particular, uh, mentioned, I mentioned a recent interview with Godwell, uh, that um, it was called An American Dilemma by Gunnar Myrdal. That was about the, what they called the Negro question in the United States. That was the American Dilemma. Well, that was an eye opener, as you can imagine, for, uh, I mean, in my, education in Memphis, Tennessee, I never heard the name Frederick Douglass. Oh, really? Uh, I never I had no idea that it was such a person. And uh, so, but I escaped that culture sort of on my own, my instinct, because the writers I was reading uh, were not uh, were trying to talk me out of the prejudices of that culture, and they did a good job of it. And uh, so, but then, of course, you're under tremendous, still under, but you can escape if you uh, can read. And if you, uh, yeah, it, 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 what, you, what you get in a good elementary education, it seems to me, are the means to... Yes, go go well beyond the prejudices of the tribe. Well, that's a that's a really interesting point, and um, and perhaps um, perhaps uh, a good place to leave the interview because we've been going now for about an hour, and it's been I don't know about you, Martin, but I've just absolutely been thrilled to talk to you, Don. It's been a it's been a, it's been really really interesting to hear your views, and one of the things that I'm going to take with me is your. Um, I'm, I'm, I've written this down. You can't be competent in the tribe until you know the law of the tribe. It reminds me of a of a Bob Dylan lyric that to live outside the law you must be honest. You know that that you we have to uh, we have to function in society, and then we we can go off and do our own thing. But um, from from me, that that was a that was really a real treat to hear you. Uh, Martin, is there anything you'd like to close with? Thank you, Don. It's been it's been a pleasure. I I, I, I love talking culture for hours and hours, and it's been a, a pleasure to spend the last hour with you discussing it. Well, thank, thank you. you. It's been a pleasure for me too. I say I don't get this kind or level of question uh, <laughs> most of the time. Okay. Well, um, so you will really welcome back any time that you want. And you say you say in this um, how to educate a citizen. Um, you say it's going to be your last book. I, I hope it isn't. Oh, yeah. but, oh, sure uh, it is. but for anyone who uh, hasn't read any of E.D. Hirsch's work, then this is a really good starting point. It's in some ways perhaps the most trenchant of your books, Tom. The most uh, the most the Thank most uh, strongly argued. And uh, and it's a uh, it's a really it's a really interesting rich read, and uh, and Thank I commend you. it to you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.